Good morning, brothers and sisters. This morning, as we return to our study in the book of Judges, shall we ask of our Heavenly Father for wisdom, for the ability to understand the figures and to properly apply them so that we may see that which we need to understand as we go forward and prepare to give the message that he would have us to give at this time in earth's history. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the many blessings that you have provided for us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to come together and study today. We ask you, Father, for wisdom. For this we need, so that we may more properly divide the word of truth. Direct us now, Father, as we join together. Help us so that we may understand the figures and the items that you would be revealing to us in these verses. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting. We ask today, Father, for your blessing. We ask for wisdom, which we can receive through your Holy Spirit. We ask for protection of your angels so that we may more properly understand that which we are seeing and so that we may be able to focus on that which you would have us and desire for us to know. Direct us now, be with us in all things, so that your character may be more properly represented. For this, Father, we praise you. For this, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Now, we left off yesterday in Judges 15, verse 17. Now, there seem to be some situations, some questions that were coming up as we were studying. What is the premise, or what, what is, what's the ultimate goal that we have here within this study? Well, we're wanting to understand how this relates to us presently. Okay. And under what premise are we studying this portion of Judges in this, well, this entire study? So when we looked at Judges from the beginning, um, well, it was really chapter 2, verse 1. It gave us a clue that this was referring to our history. And, and specifically, it goes from 2001 to 2023. So that's what Judges is addressing. And so as we've gone through all the different Judges, we could see how they progress through um, the errors that occurred in our history and God's response to that with a message. And so when we're looking at Samson here, he's, he's bringing us up to date and even a bit past our time, not much, but a little bit. So now I, I hope I'm using the right term since we, we began this with Judges 2, using an ordinal count, how many verses were there? You're saying in Judges chapter two? Yes. Yeah, well, there's 23 verses. Using a cardinal count, how many are there? Well, if you, I mean, if you started at one and you counted, there'd be 22. Thank you. And what symbol do we have from 22? Well, that's restoration. So this is a, a message of restoration. This is a, a letter from God saying, I desire my people to understand 
and to know that it is my desire for us to be restored in our communion. Now, one of the things that we were going through yesterday as, as this progressed had been a, a series of questions and a series of comments. What is the underlying bedrock that we use when we are studying scripture? What is, what is our ultimate foundation here? Well, you got Miller's Rules. Thank you. It's exactly what I wanted to hear. Now, Miller's Rules are laid out as 14 tenets for us to understand how we are going to look to study the Bible. This document is laid out with the different proofs. Now, one of the points that I think we need to look at very carefully as we, as we consider Miller's rules would be rule number six. God has revealed things to come by visions in figures and in parables. And in this way, the same things are oftentimes revealed again and again by different visions or in different figures and parables. If you wish to understand them, you must combine them all in one. This is no different that, than the rule that when we come to a verse and we don't understand it, we should bring all of those verses together to be able to understand what it's trying to tell us. <clears throat> now, I'm not trying to be critical of anyone. Yesterday, we were proceeding because there were many times that we could look at a portion of what was being said, specifically in Judges 15, and we could see that there were multiple applications, multiple figures that we could draw from those applications. In so keeping, we are applying Miller's rule number six. Now, vision, the Miller's rule number seven, visions are always mentioned as such. We are not seeing visions here yet, but we are seeing examples. Miller's rule eight, figures always have a figurative meaning and are used much in prophecy to represent future things, times, and events, such as mountains, meaning governments, beasts, meaning kingdoms, waters, meaning people, day, meaning a year, all of these are going to be important for us to note. Miller's rule eight, parables are used as comparisons to illustrate subjects and must be explained in the same way as figures by the subject and by the Bible. Miller's Rule 10, figures sometimes have two or more different significations, as day is used in a figurative sense to represent three different periods of time, namely, first, the indefinite, second, a definite or a day for a year, third, a day for a thousand years. 
The right construction will harmonize with the Bible and make good sense. Other constructions will not. When we are looking at this within Judges 15, making application on many of these figures is a work so that we can determine if we are giving an interpretation to that figure that harmonizes with scripture, that harmonizes with what we're seeing currently. We may see multiple figures with multiple different interpretations. It's not our choice or our attempt to try to confuse anyone. It is, however, necessary for us to examine these because we may find different applications within single figures. Now, in looking at this in the light of Miller's rules, does that make sense to what we were talking about yesterday? Does anybody have a problem with what I've just, what I've just read? Yeah, it, make, it makes sense. Okay. So now, here is Samson. And it came to pass when he had made an end of speaking that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand and called that place Ramath Lehi, which as the, the alternate interpretation could mean, would mean lifting up of the jawbone. Now, when you're lifting up something, are you not bringing it into sharper focus? Think about, oh, yeah. yes. what, was, what was that? I just said, yes. Thank you. Sure. So the, the example I was going to use was when the serpent was lifted up, the brass serpent in the wilderness, was that not brought into focus of the people? When Christ was lifted up on the cross, was he not lifted up in front of the nation of Israel? <clears throat> so here is Samson. He is lifting up the jawbone of the ass. So what is he bringing into sharp focus? What does he want us to consider? Well, I mean, we could say that this is about Islam. Right. Now, the other thing about the lifting up, um, so this is an ascent, so it refers to a high place. And in Ezekiel, uh, it's used uh, three times to refer to the high places in chapter 16. Uh, I shall break down thy high places, etc. Now, um, So, so here, of course, this is the jawbone of an ass, right? right. So that's where we get the symbol for Islam. And, and he's going to use it. Um, to slay a thousand men. Right, but he's he's lifting up the jawbone of the ass after he has slayed those thousand men. Right, yeah, but he's first going to use it to slay a thousand men. And 
well, he's going to cast it away. And in that casting away, um, so that's, so he's going to literally throw it away, but then he's going to call that place uh, the lifting up of the jawbone. Now, when, he, when he throws away the jawbone, is he signifying that its purpose is complete? Yep. What other symbol could the jawbone of the ass represent? I don't know. Now, he's also going to drink out of... Um, the jaw or the cheek of there's this going to water come up, but I don't know if that's the jawbone. I don't think it is. I think it's from where the jawbone was taken. Well, so we haven't got there yet, but correct. We haven't. Now, is there anything else that we can, we can determine from this particular verse? <laughs> Looking at, uh, Deuteronomy 32, 30, where it says, how should one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight, except their rock had sold them and the Lord had shut them up. So this is a judgment from God. Okay. On God's foes. So we have a judgment against the Philistines, but is this also not a judgment on, on the uh, men of Judah? Yes, it is. Now, why is it a judgment on the men of Judah? Well, they were shown they were wrong by seeing so many slain that they had allied themselves with. Okay. Now, what should the men of Judah have been ready to do? D had they seen the great strength that was given to Gideon? Had they understood the great strength? They had seen God's great strength re re revealed, yes, but they had sunk into this victim slavery mentality and didn't take advantage of the time when they could have thrown out their oppressors. So in this situation, they chose to ignore God's grace. Would that be a fair statement? Amen. Um, now, how do we approach that? And how can we approach that regarding our time right now? Or is this something that's yet future? I mean, at this point, as we were discussing yesterday, <clears throat> the men of Judah could represent the Adventist church. It could represent those in the movement that are choosing not to study, that are giving lip service to the understanding of July 18th. there were several applications that were being made. In the light of the application of Miller's rules, we should be able to see that having several applications to this passage is normal when we are studying according to Miller's rules. 
does it make sense that the men of Judah can represent both the corporate church and those in the movement that are choosing to give lip service to the message of July 18th? I um, mean at the same time or at different times? Well, I'm seeing this as different lines. Okay, so in different lines, yes. Um, but in the, in the one line, once you have a line, you, you wouldn't have it represent two different things. No, yeah. but it, it, it can do this within different lines. Yeah, so, so when we look, and the thing about the different lines is they illustrate each other, um, but specifically, all of these lines illustrate the end of the world. So even our history is typical of what's going to happen. It's not the end of what happens. Right. So, so we learn from these lines so that we can understand the future. Even the experience that we're having presently, its major importance, its main importance, is to prepare us for what's coming ahead. Now, <clears throat> I'm going to use a, a, an example that might make sense and it might not. When I travel where I live, there are times that I need to go from where I'm currently living to a, a city with the name of Wenatchee. Now, going to Wenatchee, I can go a couple of different ways. I can go using what is called Interstate 90, or I can drive on what is called US Highway 2. Both are going to get me to Wenatchee. but both have a different way of approaching this. Now, as we're looking at this with different lines, both are going to have the ultimate goal in sight. You're going from one city to another. In the situation when we're drawing out different lines and we're looking at the men of Judah being those that are in the corporate church or those that are within the movement that are giving lip service to the message of July 18th. We are still looking at this, that there will be the same basic outcome where the message of Samson is going to present before them the fact that they are not addressing their need and are not letting God lead them as he, as he would want to do. Okay. Yeah, just um, so. So we know that the, the corporate church, of course, had made arguments against this message. <coughs> right. Some arguments were reiterated. Um, really, Parminder picked up the same arguments the church was using against the 2520, for instance. And even though he was, you know, an early proponent of the 2520 and did some early presentations, he basically repudiates everything that he taught about Leviticus 26 and took the position of the church prior to uh, August of 2019. Um, so he was doing that as early as May of 2019. 
And then we had people within this movement, FFA, who had rejected Parminder, reiterating the same arguments that he had used against July 18th. So, so is, that reject, is that rejecting Parminder or giving lip service to the rejection of Parminder? Yeah, well, that's what I'm saying. Is they rejected, they rejected him, but really didn't. Right now, each one of these uh, these histories we can look at in the story of the judges from 2001 up to 2023. So each one, in a sense, is a line, but there is some some overlap, but also because we're zooming into basically way marks that exist within a line and we haven't drawn these out completely yet. I mean, that's one of the things we have to do with judges is eventually draw out all of these different judges, all of these different uh, messages and show how they illustrate our history. But when we get to Samson, uh, this is where we get to the present time more directly and and so if we're going to take uh the story of the judges and we're going to look at judah judah has to primarily here be referring to uh the people within this movement at, at the present time just because of where it's bringing us to now, it doesn't mean it can't illustrate even Adventist history, because obviously it can. Judges can illustrate lots of histories because these histories all parallel each other. But the way that we've taken judges, we've taken judges to refer from 2001 to 2023. And, and definitely that's what's being shown here is this history that we're in right now that's going to be unfolding. Um, in this movement with the, the, the Trump prediction and, uh, um, and how that's, that's going to relate to what happens in 2023. So, so I think it's important that we understand it in our time because that's where it's speaking to us the most, but we can't ignore the past because we know that the key to the, to the present and the future is the past. Understanding the past is extremely important. And so when you see these histories being repeated, they're being repeated for us. Agreed. <clears throat> now we start 1518. And he was sore athirst and called on the Lord and said, Thou hast given this great deliverance into the hand of thy servant. And now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised. <clears throat> What's being said here? I have accomplished what you have set before me. the deliverance granted at this time is for my people. Yet now I am thirsty. What else do we see here? How else should we approach this? Okay, well, we know the symbol of, of water. Well, symbol of water can mean peoples. Well, but when it comes to addressing thirst, this, this is a gospel message. Okay. So he's sore of thirst. That means he's thirsty for the truth. For the message he's desiring the message yeah. all right what is a great deliverance mm -hmm. 
Well, we could have deliverance from sin. I'm asking if the great deliverance couldn't be the first and second angel's message of Revelation 14. Well, if, if you're applying it as the everlasting gospel. Isn't that what you just did when, when you're yeah. looking at this in the message? Yeah. So, but he's been given this great deliverance, but yet he's thirsty. So something has happened that's a great deliverance, which here we have the uh, slaying of these men uh, with this jawbone of an ass, but that's not sufficient. Okay, now a comment was made in the chat. Comment being, Samson's lament reminds me of the complaints of the newly freed slaves right after their freedom from Egypt. <clears throat> would we apply it in that way? Why would we want to apply it that way? Well, I don't know if I would apply it in that this is a, there's is more complaint. I don't think he's actually really complaining i mean he's he's having a desire for something good they were desiring you know to go back to egypt um so there would be a difference there but also when we deal with the uh, the other comment that's earlier there the ass's jawbone could remind us of balaam's ass speaking um so well that happens in connection with the sunday law um, so Islam is used as a judge against God's rebellious people. So the so suggestion is maybe this is the fulfillment of the curse of Nashville. And, and, and that's what I've wondered about with when is Nashville, when was that prophecy going to be fulfilled? How would that relate to this message? Um, So I, I don't know how that's going to fit in with things yet, but uh, but we see that Islam is going to be involved again. And I would think it's primarily a message regarding Islam that is going to be addressing this thirst. I think once we see July 18th, then we will we'll thirst for more. You mean once it occurs? Yes. Yeah, I I don't think, well, I, I know what you're saying. I think something's going to happen, but I don't know if we're going to see Nashville uh, in this context here. But definitely the prophecy, the understanding of Nashville, uh, we have an understanding that's going to come, that's going to satisfy our thirst. And and it comes from this this hollow place that was in the jaw. So uh, I'm not sure um, exactly what this is, um, but it looks like where the where the the jawbone was taken from is what I picture. I'm not okay. Sure. So here again, you're jumping ahead a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So, but God clave and hollow place that was in Lehi or in the jaw and there came water there out and when he had drunk his spirit came again and he revived wherefore he called the place thereof en hak kor which is in Lehi unto this day yeah, so is this saying that there's just a hollow place in the ground that water sprung up? Well, here again, I mean, he's cast away the jawbone, right? Yeah. So does it make sense that we would have this cast that, that this hollow place would come up 
in a jawbone that's already been cast off. Well, no, not in the jawbone. I was just thinking the hollow place being from where the jawbone was taken from, but you know, it could just be a hollow place at Lehigh, the place, rather than the jawbone itself. Or right. The itself. So, because in in the kingdom, the god clave a hollow place that was in the jaw, which is Lehigh. Right. Right. So it could be just it's there's a place in Le Lehi they have this well that comes out of the ground. Just reading in the King James, it sounds like it came out from the jaw where the jaw had been, where the jawbone had been. That's that's kind of how I pictured it at first. But it does make more sense that it's just a plate, the place Lehigh, not the jawbone, literally. Okay. <clears throat> so, God clave. God, God provides this hollow place. And water comes out. When Samson had drunk, his spirit came again. So his spirit was revived. So he called the name of the place, the well of him that cried. Now, what does that mean for us today? Where else do we have someone crying out after a great effort? So it would be like, well, wouldn't this be like the midnight cry, though? Be like what? The midnight cry. Well, okay. Didn't Christ cry out on the cross? Mm hmm Comment in the chat gives reference to Psalm 84, 6. Why? Yeah, we've got 34, 6 before. 84, 6 says, okay, who passing through the valley of Baca make it a well. The rain also filleth the pools. Okay, and then Psalms 34, 6, the translators would use, this poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. Now, the trouble that Samson was facing here was a, a sore thirst. Was he not saved from his sore thirst at this point? Was he not provided with a way out from that that was plaguing him at that time? Amen. <clears throat> Judges 15, 20. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Now, the translators place this, that he seems to have judged Southwest Israel during the 20 years of their servitude toward the Philistines. <clears throat> so, now Mrs. White writes the following. Thousands of Israelites witnessed Samson's defeat of the Philistines. Yet no voice was raised in triumph till the hero, elated at, his, at this marvelous success, celebrated his own victory. But he praised himself instead of ascribing the glory to God. No sooner had he ceased than he was reminded of his weakness by a most intense and painful thirst. 
he had become exhausted by his prodigious labors and no means of supplying his need was at hand. He began to feel his utter dependence upon God and to be convinced that he had not triumphed <clears throat> by his own power, but in the strength of the omnipotent one. So consider this. How many men had of Judah had bound Samson to take him to the Philistines? Three thousand. Those three thousand witnessed Samson's defeat, but did the witness Samson's defeat of the Philistines? Yet no voice was raised in triumph. They saw the leading of God, but did not choose to do anything with this. What are we told when this destruction comes upon Nashville is going to be said? You remember? We'll be blamed for not warning them. We knew it, but we didn't warn them, warn the people that were going to be victimized. I was your neighbor and you could not tell me. Now, in this situation, should not those that, that are observing the destruction that is going to happen be warning people in advance, <clears throat> but also ascribe this, that the warning had been given because God is merciful? Right now, the church does not want this message before the world because it embarrasses them. The movement has had those that are paying lip service to this, but also the movement has had those that have chosen that the message of July 18th was a complete fallacy and it should be ignored. That's why they went through their, their positioning to say we must cast out those that are giving this message, that have been at the forefront of giving the message. Were they going to cast out Elder Jeff? No. He's treating himself as the leper outside the camp. He's letting others show their character. Because do we believe that Mrs. White has given this? Nothing else to do except believe it because it's been in print. But in giving this message to the world, it's also exposing a testing time. Are we willing to believe in the word of God? Here are 3,000 men of Judah. Ten times the 300 that stood with Gideon. They see that one person, Samson, blessed of God, slow, he slew a thousand Philistines. From here, Samson judges Israel for 20 years. All because the Philistines chose to put his wife and her father's house to death.
He then gave God the praise for his deliverance and offered an earnest prayer for relief from his present suffering. The Lord hearkened to his petition and opened for him a spring of water. In token of his gratitude, Samson called the name of the place En Hakkor, or the well of him that cried. After this victory, the Israelites made Samson judge over them, and he ruled Israel for 20 years. Now, comment from the chart, 3,000 is 10 times the number of ministers that had the 1843 chart. Okay. I believe we were establishing that Samson had come into the time of his life where he was a young man. He could have been, you know, 18, 19, maybe 20 years old. After this victory, after his wife and her father's house were put to death, he became judge over Israel for 20 years. I don't think the case could be made that Samson was 30 when he became judge. Making the case that he was anywhere from 18 to 20, I think, falls right within what the Bible is presenting. How do you see this? What are your thoughts? Now, in this situation, the translators, when Samson revived, would have looked to Genesis 45, 27. And they told him all the words of Joseph. And when he had, had said unto them, and when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. Also, Isaiah 40, verse 29. He giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increases strength. The movement right now is faint. We have no strength. We are choosing to study because we need to reaffirm where our strength comes from. We need to understand where true wisdom comes from. We need to be comparing these <clears throat> examples. Not only to understand what has gone before us, but to try to understand what is about to happen. Any comments? Boy, we seem awful quiet today. Why are we? I'm not I'm not really following what you're saying. I don't I don't I don't quite understand where you're going with. So you're trying to say that this is referring to Nashville occurring, that that's going right. to be built, right? Correct. Right. 
I'm, I'm saying very directly that this, when Nashville occurs, it's going to be very much like Samson slaying the thousand Philistines. Okay. So I don't, I don't see that Nashville being fulfilled is what's being talked about here. Okay. Then what is being talked about? A message regarding Nashville, not the actual event itself. Okay. So how would you approach that? Well, to me, this is about a message that's going to be given to this movement that we basically restore our message back on to the focus where it was. That is, there's still light that has to come regarding um, what the significance of July 18th is in regard to what didn't happen. Um, and I'm not saying like a time of when it's going to happen, but just what what is actually happening. Because from my perspective, uh, once July 18th didn't happen, there's no more talk of, of Islam, right? Nobody's really interested in what Islam is doing. I mean, there's the odd thing that happens that uh, reminds us of it and that there's a significance in July 18th, but not all of them connect directly to Islam. So right. our focus has been upon um, on the Trump part of our message, but not understanding that our line was typical and that Trump fulfilled his role already. So I, I don't see this as, because to me, if Nashville occurs, um, then nothing makes sense. Um, in the context of where we are right now, Nashville occurring sometime in the future, that makes sense. But this is dealing with the present situation, 2022-2023. So I don't see how Nashville being attacked could fit into this at all. Okay. <clears throat> will the church, would the corporate church, wake up to give a message when Nashville is destroyed? No, because when Nashville is destroyed, my understanding of it is that it's not going to be a message that's going to be involved in waking anybody up. It's going to be too late. Um, and, and, and Nashville being destroyed, the problem I always had with it is that it was an easy way out. We're, we're going to have to be giving this message without, you know, some remarkable event as such. I mean, we've had lots of remarkable events. Those haven't waken, woken anyone up yet. So there's, there's something about our message, primarily our characters, that really has to change. But Ellen White says it's going to happen. Oh yeah, it's going to happen. But it didn't happen on July 18th, and it's not going to be happening in connection with our line. She also says it's the unctions of our character that will stir people's hearts. Yeah. yeah, our character. So when we have that divine unction, the unction of the Holy Spirit, that's going to empower the message. And it's so define, define unction. Well, it's, it's something that's given by God. God uh, empowers a person. It's like, um, uh, what's the word mean Spirit? specifically? Um, sentiment maybe? No, it's, no. it's like, um, um, uh, 
it's like the seal of approval sort of thing it's like god's god's anointing is upon us so when you have the unction of the holy spirit it it means that we're sort of marked right. so i mean i think that's always been a problem a foolish and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign but no sign shall be given but the sign of jonah and I don't think it's going to be some event that's going to wake people up. I, I think that's been quite clear already that we can't we can't go that direction because even the remarkable things that have happened, the history that we're in, isn't really waking people up. They sort of blink their eyes for a moment, but then they go back to their slumber. So it has to be something else. But there is a message regarding Islam that has to be understood by this movement. What exactly that is, what's gonna satisfy our thirst, and how that's connected to Islam, I don't know. But I don't think it's the attack on Nashville. Islam's response to the Sunday law. Yeah, Islam definitely is going to be involved, but I see it more after the Sunday law, right? As you're saying, it's a response. Yeah, yeah I would say it's a lot after Sunday law. So probation for Adventists will have closed by then. Yeah, so I mean, I've held this view for a long time that Nashville is not going to happen until much later. It's not going to be there to vindicate this movement's message any any more than the Trump prediction is going to vindicate this movement movement's message. On July eighteenth. I'm not going to disagree with you that the message about Trump is not going to vindicate this message yeah because the situation with mr trump is to me a it's it's sleight of hand mm -hmm. it's a magician's trick it's taking our attention away from where this should be now mrs white was given the vision of destruction coming upon nashville which will occur. Agreed. Yeah. But should this warning be a, an impetus to be studying further with people that have chosen to live within Nashville? Well, uh, but, you know, our message right now is about the coming Sunday law and we misplaced Nashville. And, and the only reason we misplaced it is because the symbols were there, but the event wasn't going to occur. But the proclamation of a message regarding Nashville was to be given at that time. And, and we can parallel that with the Millerite history. They gave a message about the second coming of Christ. But the second coming of Christ didn't happen at the time they expected. But it doesn't mean that their proclamation of the time for the second coming of Christ was wrong. It was to be given. But the second coming of Christ and Nashville, these events happened too late to change somebody's situation. So Nashville will occur, but it's not going to occur as some um impetus for the movement it's not going to be something that's going to help us give a message to the levites but the message of nashville still needs to be understood what we proclaimed we have to understand that it was correct 
just as October 22nd, 1844 was correct. But there, there was something we didn't understand. And that was the typical nature of our line. So, so for us as a movement, once we understand this, we can become united in the proclamation of a message. And that message is, is the message of the third angel's message, as well as the second angel's message, as well as the first angel's message. These have to be given to Adventism, but they first have to be experienced by this movement. All right. So the application then is our focus should be not on Trump, not on Islam, but on the messages of Revelation 14 so that they can be empowered by the, the message of the angel of Revelation 18. Would that be a fair statement? Well, yeah, I mean, that's been our message this whole time. That's what this movement is about. It's about the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages um, in preparation to receive the third angel's message. And Revelation 18 has been fulfilled at 9-11, but continues to be fulfilled because it's about the Sunday law. So this whole movement, this whole history is what Ellen White saw from a distance as Revelation 18, the mighty angel coming down. And that's what's been occurring in this history and in our movement specifically. So that's going to have to be understood and experienced in order for this movement to make any sense. So if this movement cannot get, it, get its act together, so to speak, and accomplish the task that was given it. I mean, we can't we can't see this history progress. Somebody else would have to do it. So this movement must figure this out. But it's not going to be some some event that's going to be the impetus other than what occurs in the movement itself. The movement itself is stagnant. It needs to be um, called to action. And, and that means based on what we've seen in these lines, story of Ezra, etc., we have this period of time in which we're being tested. We have these 10 days before the first day of the 10th month. That 10 days ends in 2023. And then we're going to have on January 12th, the, the, the divorce of the strange wives is supposed to occur. Whether that literally happens or what that even particularly means, I'm not certain. But that's what the lines show. And so that's what should happen in this movement. This movement should be going back to the foundation, going back to Miller's rules, and studying once again. and coming to the correct conclusions and having the correct experience so that it can now do what it's been called to do. And the movement isn't doing that right now. So it's not gonna be some event that's gonna happen because that's what people are looking for. Some event that sort of would vindicate us so that we can now, people will listen to us. But the thing is, we're not the people that anybody would wanna listen to. We don't have a character of Christ. All we can do is damage. So until we're changed, we're not gonna receive this light. Until we're separated from the strange wives, we're not going to understand our message completely.
All right. Any other comments? Okay. The next chapter that we will be looking at is Judges 16. Samson escapeth from Gaza by carrying away the gates of the city. Delilah corrupted by the Philistines urgeth him to tell her his strength lay. He thrice deceived her, but at length prevailed upon and his head shaven. The Philistines take him and put out his eyes, but his strength is renewed as his hair growth. The Philistines hold a great feast to Dagon and send for Samson to make them sport, who pulleth down the house upon the heads of his enemies and is slain with them. This is the part of the story of Samson that many have a very cursory understanding upon. Judges 16.1, then went Samson to Gaza and saw there an harlot and went into her. Now in the alternate Hebrew, then went Samson to Gaza and saw there a woman and harlot and went in unto her. Is this a false message? A false double message, so a false second angel's message. How should we apply this? Well, it involves a harlot. Right. False message. Harlot can be a false message. So we have, okay, a woman and harlot. That's why I'm asking, because is this not a doubling of a type? How well should we see this? Oh. A doubling of a woman and harlot? Yeah. Uh, it's not a doubling. Okay. Then what is it? Um, well, it's just, it's just how you would write it in Hebrew. You're not. Um, when, it, when they call it a harlot, I'm sorry. Like you're not dealing with two of the same words. What are we dealing with then? Well, it's, that's how you you say a harlot. Hebrew. You, it's a uh, a woman adulterer. It's basic, but it or a wanton woman, right? So it's it's not a doubling. Okay. And it was told the Gazites, Gazaites, saying, Samson is come hither. And they compassed him in and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, in the morning when it is day, we shall kill him. So they stayed silent through that night. They sought his death for the morning. And Samson lay till midnight <clears throat> and arose at midnight 
and took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them upon his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Now, it might be interesting to consider this. I think it's, it's the counterfeit of Christ carrying his cross up the hill of Calvary. Okay. Just a moment. Come on. Can we say that this whole story here represents uh, the death of Christ? Because hmm. remember, this is an ironic story. Okay. And Samson is a type of Christ. But this would represent our history. Okay. And so, yeah. Go ahead. So, you know, him going into a harlot, I mean, this obviously is a negative thing, but Christ came to this earth to redeem mankind. And, and so we see here in Samson this, this, this negative picture of, of what Christ came to do. Uh, I mean, because in the end, we can see those pillars that are going to be torn down. Um, that's going to be Christ dying on the cross. That's the, the structural chiasm of the, the thieves on the cross, as well as uh, the seventieth week. So this is the victory of Christ, and this is the victory of Christ in His people at the end of the world. This is about the hundred and forty-four thousand, but presented in an ironic story. Right now, as we're considering the literal portion of the story. If you look here to the lower left, you see where this map maker would, would state that Gaza had been. But if we look here to the center, lower center of this, he carries the gate, the posts, and the bar from Gaza to Hebron. What do you show as being the distance between Gaza and Hebron? And is this, is this number significant? Either in literal sense or as a type. Okay, so you're talking about the modern, so if we go from Gaza to Hebron, Uh, hang on. Okay, so from Hebron to Gaza. Hmm. I got both the cities here. It's not working. So I, I, I don't know the distance. <laughs> not working so okay 
Oh, I'll find it somehow. So Samson lays until midnight. He rises at midnight. He took the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and went away with them, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of a hill that is before Hebron. And yeah, so the distance is um, as, a, as the crow flies. Uh, 37 kilometer or 37 miles and 60 kilometers. A driving is 52 miles and 83 kilometers. About okay. an hour and eight minutes, it says here. About what? An hour and eight minutes. Okay. So we're dealing with 68 minutes, depending on the speed that you that you keep. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you're going to have different people give different times and. But in a situation like that, this is not a man driving. This is a man that's walking. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're going about 37 miles, I mean, you're probably not going to do that in a day when you're carrying the city gates. So it doesn't say how long he took to do that. I mean, I, I have a friend, he carried a 400-pound uh, uh, cast iron stove uh, a mile on his back. Ouch. Yeah, he was, he was the neighborhood strongman here. Um, Still, ouch. Yeah. <laughs> so we're talking that here is Samson carrying something roughly 37 miles. to carry the gates of a city, the posts, the bar, the doors, the everything. That's quite a feat. Now, Mrs. White writes, one wrong step prepares the way for another. Samson had transgressed the command of God by taking a wife from the daughters of the Philistines. And before long, he ventured again among that people, now his deadly enemies, in the indulgence of his unlawful passions, trusting confidently in his great strength, which had inspired the Philistines with such terror, he boldly entered Gaza, one of their largest and most powerful cities, and visited a harlot of that place. This disgraceful fact was soon made known to the inhabitants of the city who were eager to be avenged upon their dreaded foe. Fearing to attack him, however, they sent for reinforcements and kept a vigilant watch, or vigilant watch at the gate of the city, determined by some means to put him to death in the morning. At midnight, Samson was aroused. The accusing voice of conscience filled him with remorse. And as he remembered that he had broken his vow as a Nazarite. But despite his sin, God's mercy had not forsaken him. His great strength again served to deliver him, wrenching the city gate from its place. He took it entire with its posts and bars and carried it 37 miles to the top of a hill on the way to Hebron. The guards, meanwhile, being too much surprised and terrified to intercept or pursue him. The symbol of him laying until midnight and arising at midnight, where the voice of conscience 
wakes him up. What can we say about this example? What figuratively can we see here? What message is Samson representing at this time? Well, I mean, we, when we have a gate and we have the two posts and we have the bar, I mean, I mean, this is representing Christ and it's the midnight cry, which is midnight is the center of a chiasm as we know in Millerite history. So this would be one of the things that shows that Samson is illustrating Christ. Even though, again, the story is a negative story, but it's ironic in its application. What else do we see? Well, with the two points, two posts, you see the doubling, right? Um, the top of a hill that is before Hebron. Um, this brings us back to other histories as well, but, um, you know, Samson lay till midnight. So this is a tarrying. And then there's midnight. And then he arises at midnight. Uh, those are the symbols. Um, what kind of message is Samson representing by his choice to indulge his passions? Well, I, I don't think we can look at it that way, though. I mean, we can't look at, even though we can look at Samson in the literal sense negatively, that's not what he's representing. Okay, how so? Well, because he's he's representing Christ. So even though everything he's doing is is wrong it's illustrating something that that happened to christ and also happens at the end of the world okay but now let's as i look at something from the chat the tendency of human nature to revert to its sinfulness or evil habits even after a great exploit by god as was shown in the preceding chapter mm -hmm. so that would be our literal application of the lesson of this story right would that be our literal application or our figurative application oh, that would be literal i mean we're just talking about samson as a person his actions what they what they represent literally they represent human nature in its sinfulness to revert you know after a great victory to divert back to um, our fallen nature. But symbolically, he's not illustrating that. He's illustrating Christ taking upon himself human nature. But in this, in this particular example, this is occurring some years after that victory with the jawbone of the ass. I don't think that this is occurring days after. I think it, it may be occurring years after that he's given. He, he's allowed his passions sway. Yeah, we just don't know how long it is afterwards. I mean, but anyway, the point is he's illustrating Christ taking upon himself human nature. Um, so even though this is a negative story, 
when we make an application of it spiritually, it's illustrating Christ, what he came to do to save humanity. And it's uh, um, illustrating God's people at the end of the world. But yeah, it's a negative story. So if you're going to take the story as a story and the lessons that are learned from those in the literal sense, he's a bad example. But we're, we're using the types here, the symbols. And so these are the symbols of the cross, um, of Christ dying upon the cross that are going to be illustrated here. And, and Christ carrying his cross, which would illustrate his life as well, because he took up his cross when he took upon himself our human nature. Okay. Now, <clears throat> We're going to have a lot more to talk. I'm sorry. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I was just going to say, wouldn't he represent Peter? Because Peter, Peter represents both, both aspects of it. Yeah, so Peter represents uh, a positive and a negative illustration that Jeff had taught about with Peter. So th this was an issue that people had, is how can we take something negative and have it illustrate something positive? You know, how could we take uh, the story of Esther, who's really doing the wrong thing, and she's going to illustrate the right thing, and the story of Vashti uh, doing the right thing, but she's illustrating the wrong thing. But we know that that's what happens in Scripture. So, so we can take the lessons of Samson. We can, we can see, you know, this is, this is a negative thing. He is a negative character. But he is a judge. And as such, he typifies Christ. And so the way that we have him typify Christ is we look at the symbols that are being used. And we can see that they parallel the symbols uh, that ties to the story of Christ. But also to the history at the end of the world. So I know it's difficult sometimes when you're doing that because you're looking at this negative story, but you have to flip it on its head positively once you, once you understand the symbols. Okay, now we're going to have to return to this tomorrow. Mm -hmm. We're going to have a lot to cover again in these first three, first three verses of Judges 16. We are now at the close of our time together for today. Are there any other comments or questions at this point that we should consider through the day before we assemble again tomorrow? All right, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, as we have examined what we are seeing in the story of Samson, we may be seeing much of ourselves. Help us, Father, that we may rely upon you and not upon ourselves for that which is most necessary, that we may recognize our need of your character and that our characters are to be laid in the dust. Help us through this day, be with us, in all that you would have us to do so that your character and that which you would have revealed to the world would be presented. Be with us now. We ask, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.